So I think uh, people are still uh, trying to log on, uh, but we should make a start. It's already two minutes past nine. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to episode five of uh, our uh, LNG to Power Projects uh, series. Episode five will look at multi-user facilities. <clears throat> and uh, before we start, I just have a few uh, housekeeping matters to, to clear. Uh, please note uh, that all your microphones and cameras have been turned off centrally. Please keep them off throughout uh, the webinar. And uh, if you have a question, if it occurs to you during the webinar, please just uh, put it in the Q&A function uh, on your the screens and uh, we will address those if we have time at the end of the webinar. And if not, we'll get back in touch with you uh, afterwards. Um, the webinar is being recorded and uh, the slides and the recordings will be made available uh, to all those who have registered for, for this webinar. And also just to let you know, following the webinar, we will send you a short feedback form. And we would be really grateful if you could fill that in, take a few moments uh, to consider uh, because it will help us greatly to tailor our offering to your needs or interests and, and wishes. So without much further ado, and please uh, speakers turn on your, uh, your, your cameras for this. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the team today. Uh, my name is Heike Trishman and I'm an ENP lawyer at uh, uh, partner at uh, uh, Watson Farley uh, Williams in London. Um, uh, for this episode on uh, multi-user facilities, I have great pleasure to introduce you to Phil Nutman, who is uh, Managing Director of um, uh, QED Consulting. And uh, Phil has over 30 years of experience in the energy industry, 20 of those uh, in advisory services, and I have known him for 10 or 15 years of those 20 years, and we have worked together in the past. Uh, Phil has led numerous consultancy projects advising international oil and gas companies, governments and financial institutions on a variety of issues, strategy, gas pricing and tariffs, uh, commercial structuring and negotiations, regulation, valuation and uh, just uh, you know, overall transactions. Previously, he was a director at Gas Strategies, which is another consultancy here in London, and at PwC Corporate Finance in London. And prior to that, he actually worked in the oil and gas and power industries as commercial manager and senior contract negotiator for British Gas, as it was then, and Total. And I hope you agree that uh, he will be perfect or is the perfect uh, person to, to lead us through third party access uh, issues today. His recent experience on LNG import and power projects includes the multi-user FSIU uh, terminal in, uh, in, in Lithuania and another project in Morocco, both are still ongoing, as well as the first um, uh, import project in, in Pakistan uh, and other projects in Chile, Israel, Malta and Thailand. I'm also joined again today and I have great pleasure to welcome her back. Uh, by Daisy East, uh, a project finance partner uh, of, of the firm here in London, and Marcus Dodds, an LNG uh, marine and shipping um, specialist uh, and, and a former master mariner also based here in London, in, in our London office. Just in terms of agenda, you can see uh, the, you know, the bullets there. I will be doing the quick recap of what we have learned in previous episodes of our LNG to Power webinar series, um, uh, particularly our first one, which was the risk matrix uh, mitigants. And in doing so, I will focus obviously on the downstream LNG to Power part. Uh, I will then give a brief introduction on what it means to have gas market regulation and particularly um, the introduction of mandatory third party access requirements in a project country and what that does perhaps to the project design. Phil will then explore in some more detail some of the complexities resulting from TPA, third party access, and uh, comparing it uh, to access to pipelines and uh, LNG regasification facilities. Marcus is then going to look at the operational consideration, particularly uh, from a maritime perspective, and uh, Daisy 
on the financing considerations. So the, uh, the additional risks uh, lenders may have to battle with uh, because there's third party access introduced in a country. Turning then to the webinar itself, uh, and, and just our little recap, and for those who have already participated earlier in, in these, uh, that, that slide will be familiar. Um, uh, so um, this is literally just borrowed to set the scene and recap what we have learned from previous episodes, uh, where we have basically touched on LNG as a key component uh, although and while the world transitions to net zero future, uh, because that is particularly so in uh, uh, you know, emerging markets, uh, which need to transition away from coal um, for a cleaner uh, power production. Uh, and, and that's of course also true for countries like Poland and, and Germany, so not just emerging ones. As such, we suggested that LNG to power will be an important feature going forward. And although we feel that COVID has shine quite a, a light on, on transition in general. We, we believe that gas and LNG to power will, will be here for the next uh, few years. We established that a change of the uh, traditional point-to-point -point LNG delivery system, which we can see here, to a more dynamic market was, uh, was possible, particularly uh, because of the introduction of so-called uh, LNG aggregators, which you can see here but also the more modular and floating uh, facilities uh, which uh, FLNG and FSRUs and FSUs bring. And those technology and market changes have really enabled, we feel, uh, the, the difference in, in LNG uh, value chain to emerge. And, and uh, that is uh, basically seen in the emergence of LNG to power projects. As we have seen, and those who have been here before will also know this slide, as we have seen in these projects, the use of uh, one supplier of an onshore LNG import terminal or a floating facility such as an FSRU linked with one uh, you know, off-taker, for example, a power plant, will create a, a certain risk matrix. And we looked at that in previous uh, episodes. Um, and particularly project on project risk, depending on how the project is structured. Uh, this risk matrix will then be further complicated uh, the more um, participants are being introduced here. Uh, so, uh, for example, if there are more power producers, they may wish to uh, go all the way to LNG supply and wish to have access to the LNG, but also the gas infrastructure in order to take that gas right from the source to their uh, power plant, uh, as I said, to mitigate the risks on the way, particularly project on project risks. And the methods of addressing these risks will obviously depend very much on the local jurisdictions. And uh, we already made that point and, and we, we will cover today, you know, some of these issues in general terms, but we very much feel that there is no one fits all solutions. Again, this will be familiar to some of you who have participated here before. And this looks at some of the corporate structures that are being used uh, to, um, uh, to mitigate some of these risks. And uh, we talked about uh, that, you know, political risk and therefore perhaps reduced access to debt capital on the one hand, and uh, the need to place uh, the often uncommitted LNG quantities into demand countries on the other hand, has forced uh, aggregators, portfolio, portfolio players, uh, for example, ExxonMobil, uh, BP, Shell, Total, you name it, uh, to develop their own LNG to power projects on an integrated basis. Uh, so the integrated project we discussed does not work if you have, for example, infrastructure ownership requirements um, and or third party access introduced, and then you need um, corporate structures which basically help you achieve uh, those, those goals. And those corporate uh, structures will then be uh, uh, supplemented by uh, the relevant contract structures. Again, the integrated structure uh, at the top of the of this slide. Uh, but if we have third party access or other uh, requirements, then uh, the back to back and tolling structures are more often used. 
and the tolling structure we discussed is perhaps the less uh, the, the one producing less um, project on project risk uh, so it's quite often more implemented than back to back but the both of them can be used together uh, that integrated structure of course also doesn't work where you already have uh, certain parts of the uh, downstream supply chain in place in a country. So for example, there may be already parts of a, a gas market there, uh, there may be a, a pipelines there, and um, uh, then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the other thing which may happen is that you already have IPPs there, and um, uh, basically they uh, may use domestic gas uh, which may be declining and therefore they are now looking to LNG uh, to um, uh, supplement or completely replace uh, their, their LNG, uh, their uh, fuel source. So the basic question for this webinar is probably why might a country introduce third party access in the first place? And historically this was done obviously to um, uh, break some monopoly uh, of a perhaps a national oil company and introduce competition. And uh, this was done in what is now developed markets, uh, which was then obviously not so developed uh, as in the US, the UK, Australia, and the EU. And uh, emerging markets are you know, uh, following suit and they uh, very much realize that the importance uh, of uh, third party access rules lie in getting new players into the market and therefore increase competition. And, and hopefully improve uh, supply efficiency and service quality, reduce tariffs, and just generally, you know, improve capacity utilization and, and overall uh, strengthen the country's energy security uh, of supply. Multi-party usage, as we can see on, on the next slide, uh, basically uh, now introduces, as I said before, uh, another layer of complexity. And um, <clears throat> these uh, multi-users can be on the supply side and on the offtake side or, or both, as we can see here. And the most recent examples for introduction of TPA regimes are Thailand and Brazil, where basically uh, that is being uh, hoped to, to, to uh, introduce a competition and uh, break down the monopoly of PTT in Thailand uh, and Petrobras in Brazil in, in particular. But of course, each TPA provision will affect uh, each market player uh, completely differently, depending on that player's position in the market. Um, they will have different and often conflicting or opposing uh, interests and outlooks on the market. And it therefore takes a, uh, a gas market regulator uh, that will be required to set the rules of the game to ensure fair and transparent and uh, uh, non-discriminatory infrastructure access. And of course, it will depend on how uh, stronger enforcement uh, uh, powers that um, uh, regulator has in order to uh, keep everybody to the rules. So where there's mandatory third party access requirements, obviously we have access to many more uh, customers. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, perhaps more LNG supply sources, but that will also mean that we now have many more um, uh, access agreements in place to the infrastructure. And that could be done by a code uh, or perhaps bilateral agreements. Uh, although where there are many users, that's uh, not very useful. And, and that will, of course, bring uh, potentials for uh, associated risks of mismatch, really, where these um, uh, part participants do not uh, follow the rules uh, in terms of scheduling uh, nominations and balancing, and perhaps also LNG and gas quality. And at this point, I would like to hand over to Phil, uh, who will look at this uh, in, in, in some more detail. Phil, over to you. I go. Thank you very much uh, for that, and a thank you on on uh, behalf of myself and of QED uh, to Watson Farley Williams for uh, for uh, asking us to to join for this discussion uh, today. And over the next twenty minutes or so, what I'd like to do is to explore a bit more the concept of uh, multiple users, uh, both in terms of uh, the LNG terminals. Uh, but I will actually start looking at the downstream side, the onshore uh, gas pipelines. 
Um, where, of course, third party access is something which is commonplace in liberalized and uh, mature gas markets. I think we've all um, been used to that over the years. Uh, but now there is a bit of a difference. Uh, I, want, I really want to explore that when we look at new projects and in particular new projects in developing markets uh, and uh, what what third party access means in this case uh, can can lead to some uh, different uh, risk management approaches let's put it that way so um, I want to start then with the pipeline third party access before considering the LNG terminals and there are two questions I'll uh, come back to uh, at uh, towards the end of this which is uh, firstly um, are there third party access regimes that you can apply in the gas pipelines quite similar to the uh, regimes that are appropriate for uh, LNG import terminals? Uh, and secondly, third party access uh, within onshore terminals, how similar is that uh, to uh, third party access multi-users within the FSIU environment? So if we turn to that next slide and we uh, look then at a fairly simple case of uh, third party access in the gas pipeline system. So here we've got uh, more than one power plant off taking gas from the, uh, from the same system. So what we've assumed here is there's some form of uh, LNG aggregation taking place uh, up front. So we don't need to think too much about uh, third party access further upstream. And then there is a sale of regasified LNG so uh, of the gas as it exits the terminal and enters into the downstream system. Each power company then is responsible uh, for shipping their own gas needs through this uh, common user system uh, to, to meet their own plant requirements. So this pipeline operator can either be a, a transmission system operator, an independent uh, company, either state owned or perhaps um, uh, in place as the result of a, of a, uh, of a concession. Um, or indeed, it could be one of the power companies themselves who initially developed the pipelines for their own needs, um, but now need to open that up for the needs of a uh, third party user, which is the second uh, power company. Irrespective, in this relatively simple setup, we can look at uh, point to point gas transportation agreements, uh, either with tariffs on a regulated basis or more likely just on a negotiated basis uh, in order to put in place uh, the uh, operational uh, and uh, commercial requirements for facilitating third party access through that system. In the next slide, um, we're talking about the same system, but now it's become a bit more complex and um, we have still the power company using that system, but now we have the uh, gas aggregator. So the gas aggregator, um, uh, all it's, although it's been uh, only one you know, uh, second shipper still, it is aggregating on behalf of different customers who are in different locations, and each of those will have different volumetric uh, gas needs. Um, so how different is this to the previous example where we just had uh, uh, two main power off takers? Well, two things, firstly, in terms of complexity uh, and secondly, on the control basis, in terms of the complexity, the, power, the point to point um, system really doesn't work when we talk about all these other um, uh, users off taking at various points around. It quickly becomes too complex uh, and unmanageable we now need a common uh, system to enable us to balance the network uh, and also for uh, charging to ensure that there is uh, fair and equal access to this network. And this is normally encapsulated through a, a gas code and operating code uh, that all users or shippers of the system will sign on to. So as well as the complexity going up, the control uh, now is different. In the previous example where we just had the two users, uh, it's certainly uh, not unusual for the two power companies, irrespective of whether there happens to be a TSO or not, but the two power companies can decide and uh, often will operate on the basis that to speak to one another, 
and they organize the gas requirements on a day based on their own respective dispatch needs. That's clearly not going to uh, uh, work in this in this case now. And the power company that may have been in a, a, a position where it had on felt it had more control over gas flows on a day now must hand that over to the TSO who assumes responsibility for ensuring uh, each of the offtakers gets the gas uh, that it requires on each day. So the control as well as the complexity are two main changes that happens once we uh, develop the market and develop the system in which that uh, LNG to power project is taking place. Gas systems are tend to be balanced on a daily basis um, with each shipper ensuring that the amount of gas it puts into the system on a day uh, equates to the output. Um, now, that's fine and it's sort of accepted um, for uh, a, a, a mature market. But in a developing market, in particular for the gas aggregator now, that's, that's, that's quite a lot to take on. Um, how easy is it for a gas aggregator to know how quickly uh, the market will grow and to what extent it will grow to meet the projected demand. Um, you know, it tends to take a few years in order for uh, the aggregator to have the confidence to know exactly uh, how much and how, how, how far that market will be able to, to grow and the various off-takers be able to honor their own uh, promises and commitments. Also, it's interesting, I think, in terms of the interface now with the LNG, as I mentioned, the downstream system will be balanced, generally speaking, on a daily basis. Um, the physical setup of that will mean that LinePack allows you some hours grace, if you like, in terms of balancing. Um, but beyond that, uh, it, it, it would take a lot more capital investment to, to enable you to balance outside uh, the daily basis. And so now you've got an interface between a system that's balancing on a daily basis and a, a, an import terminal that is expecting LNG cargoes, possibly only once every few weeks, especially to begin with, could even be on a monthly or, or, or two monthly basis. So how then do you manage the operations and the interface uh, between those uh, two different working operational systems? It's uh, something that we need to explore. We also need to look at the, um, uh, the commercial risk of the TSO in this case. The, the TSO, it's, it's pretty much a low risk business. Once, once it's set up, it, it is there in order to transport the gas, it is not taking, uh, it's not trading the gas, it is simply the operator of the gas system, uh, trying to ensure that uh, the inputs and, and outputs are all uh, balanced uh, and met up. And uh, inevitably, uh, this, this means that the, uh, the, there isn't that much commercial um, uh, uh, play in the transportation sector of the whole gas chain. So if you think about a, a power plant, let me take a theoretical number about nine or ten dollars for delivered gas to a power plant, um, nine or ten dollars uh, per MMBTU. Now that may equate to six or seven dollars delivered LNG uh, at the terminal and then you've got a dollar, perhaps a bit more than a dollar for the uh, for the fees and tariffs to be paid to the terminal operator, another one to two dollars, perhaps maximum, for the pipeline operator. And of that one to two dollars, you're probably looking at 80% of that associated with paying back the initial capital cost of that pipeline system. Therefore, the TSO is not going to be in a position to assume a high amount of commercial risk. Now that is something that's certainly been acceptable uh, to investors in mature systems where they acknowledge that the, the risk is low, uh, but now we have to consider who is going to uh, have to assume that risk in the absence of being able to pass it on to the TSO who's responsible for delivering the gas within the system. On the next slide, we will uh, look back now uh, further upstream 
where we have these uh, multiple users on the LNG side. So this is again the introduction that we came uh, into. We may have uh, uh, LNG aggregation to some extent, but there are now a number of LNG buyers uh, wanting to deliver and uh, store uh, their LNG in the terminals and then to regasify it into the adjoining pipeline network. So how does this work? I think it's easier for us to consider in terms of um, uh, an FSIU, simply because it's a, a similar capacity to the carrier that's bringing in the cargoes. Uh, the same principles in terms of operations will apply to the onshore terminal, but as we will see, there's a very different um, uh, risk outcome uh, to the operations of the onshore terminal in, in most cases. So the key principle for third-party access through the LNG terminal is going to be based around borrowing and lending. And as we can see in the next slide, uh, and this uses a, a, a nominal example, if you like, of three users uh, through a, uh, a terminal here. Um, two of the users are uh, using around 40% uh, of the capacity and the third user at 20%. So the top of that diagram shows how the cargoes are uh, coming in and each of those users are taking turns uh, dependent on their respective capacities to bring in the next cargo. Uh, but in terms of the output, which is the part at the bottom of the slide, then you can see each of them is able to offtake on each day um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an equal rate so that they can meet their downstream commitments. And what enables them to do this is the first shipper will bring in the first cargo Effectively, shippers two and three will borrow um, some of that LNG to meet their ongoing needs, and they will repay that when they themselves bring in the next cargo uh, or the cargo after that. So that over time, they're able to uh, balance the LNG within the, uh, within the storage, assuming, of course, that their uh, outputs are as, as planned and, uh, and that the, each of them are taking more or less uh, those predicted levels. So what are the requirements for this to work? Um, key requirements really is that there's a, a, it does require a great deal of information um, on the inputs and outputs to the terminal and that these have to be shared, not only with the terminal operator, but obviously uh, between the users themselves. And then there have to be uh, mechanisms, commercial mechanisms in place to deal with either quantitative or qualitative issues uh, as and when they arise. So there may be off-spec LNG arising, uh, or there may be Im imbalances where uh, one of the off-takers has undertaken or, uh, or overtaken uh, against their requirements. Uh, that all needs to be dealt with in some uh, contractual manner, as well as having to deal with it on the day, of course, um, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the need to balance. And in particular for an FSRU, uh, you'll see in, in, in the case here, you are having to run down during normal operations, the storage uh, within the FSRU in order to allow the next LNG carrier to, uh, to offload when it's scheduled to come in next. And uh, you will probably have to uh, be able to 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 to, um, to balance and to uh, to enable uh, enable you to come down to the minimum heel, if you like, within the FSIU, mm -hmm. so that the uh, the next cargo can take place. And obviously, if one of the users has undertaken, uh, then that can cause issues and that can cause delays in terms of the next cargo coming in. The next slide is a, um, uh, a similar uh, outlook, but it's a slightly simpler case. Uh, I wanted to use this one, uh, if only for the reason that it's actually taken from uh, the Lithuanian uh, uh, import terminal, which is an FSIU, and it's one of the few real examples of third party access, which has been uh, in place uh, and implemented for an FSIU. Most of the other locations where 
third planetary axis has been imposed, in fact, have been for onshore terminals. Um, uh, but this one just, you know, demonstrates the fact that it 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 is uh, it is possible. Um, it has to be said that there aren't that many uh, third party users there, or to the extent that there are more users, they actually tend to come in with much smaller uh, parcels of LNG, and that again is easier to uh, to manage. So in the final section, as we move into the next slide, um, I wanted to uh, just pick on three particular areas uh, for a bit further uh, consideration. Uh, the first of these is to compare, as I mentioned earlier, the onshore and the offshore um, uh, solutions for LNG terminals. And the assumption here is that the onshore uh, will probably have more than one tank and that the total storage capacity will be uh, somewhat greater than the capacity for uh, an LNG carrier that's coming in. And what this means is that although all the same issues can arise, um, the ability to operationally mitigate uh, those risks are, are much greater in the case of the onshore uh, um, terminal, so that uh, you don't have to be running down to um, minimal stock before the next cargo arrives. Uh, you should have sufficient excess uh, capacity onshore to be able to, to manage any mismatch uh, in terms of the offtake from the terminal. And also in terms of quality, if there is a, a, an off-spec uh, uh, cargo coming in, for instance, uh, it may be possible to, to manage that because it can go into a separate tank onshore uh, and then there can be blending uh, and other operational solutions to be able to manage that off-spec gas. So the issues are the same, but the uh, ability to manage uh, each of those and to mitigate the risks uh, are much uh, are much better, uh, are much easier in, in the case of the onshore terminals. Uh, the next point I wanted to consider uh, was uh, the regulatory impact. Uh, and apologies here, I've broken my own rules here and uh, there's only text on this slide, uh, but I, I can't really think of any interesting pictures for regulation. So please forgive me and, uh, and, and bear with me. Um, it is worth uh, taking into account the fact that third party access, as uh, we've already discussed, is something which is uh, known about, accepted, um, and lenders certainly have, have got very used to that but they've generally been applied um, initially within mature markets uh, and the infrastructure is quite mature and there's a lot of information around in terms of what the, uh, the market is doing and its operations. For new developments and new markets, then um, you know, it's always been recognized that there are additional risks to be taken into account and it's uh, notable that the vast majority of new terminals that have been developed uh, within Europe have sought uh, and been granted 10-year uh, derogations from third-party access uh, obligations that would otherwise apply under the directives. Uh, and indeed, a similar um, construct has applied to uh, those newer gas markets where uh, distribution companies have again been granted a um, uh, up to 10 year uh, derogation from um, third party access and, uh, and market liberalization measures in order for the investors to be comfortable with the risk that they're taking on uh, and that third party access will only come along later. So you know, there is quite a track record of uh, regulators and governments wanting in the first place to facilitate new investment, and only once that's taken place will there be a managed uh, move over to uh, open markets uh, and to third party access. I think it's worth also considering the, the role of the regulator um, in reality for the likes of the Singapore LNG import project, where um, there was a, a, a single aggregator, uh, in this case, BG to begin with, and they were brought in to um, uh, to purchase uh, and resale LNG on behalf of a number of power customers 
within Singapore. In turn, in order to facilitate that and to underpin the first um, uh, uh, project uh, within Singapore, the regulator um, uh, guaranteed dispatch levels for uh, for those power stations that would be relying on LNG. And that guaranteed dispatch effectively um, gave a minimum uh, LNG volume uh, that could be relied upon, which, which facilitated that, that purchase and facilitated the initial investment. It also helped, of course, that there was an existing gas market, which had been based on uh, not indigenous gas in this case, but imported pipeline gas. Um, and of course, the uh, Singapore um, project is, again, an onshore uh, project with, with multiple tanks uh, involved. Uh, but it's also true to say that very quickly, that single aggregator model has moved on uh, and further licenses uh, have been given out by the regulator to uh, other importers and aggregators uh, feeding into that market. I think there are now uh, certainly three, if not four, um, uh, licenses granted for uh, LNG import into Singapore. So those are the points uh, I wanted to raise in terms of regulation. And then finally, um, to end with the picture, uh, which I like to do, um, how many users? I think it's uh, this is again perhaps a difference between terminals and um, you know a, a, an open access regime within uh, a, a an onshore pipeline system, because we're dealing with cargoes coming in on the one hand and regasification going out on on the other hand, it, it, especially within a constrained capacity environment, then it quickly gets really quite complex uh, from an operational point of view to, to manage that and to manage the, the balancing that has to go on. Uh, and certainly within the industry, uh, there's a, a general acceptance of the fact that uh, getting much beyond three or possibly four users within uh, any one LNG terminal uh, might be just a stretch uh, and a bit too far. On that note, I would like to pass on to Marcus, who uh, knows a, a great deal more than I do uh, about the operational aspects in terms of LNG terminals. Thank you. What I'm going to speak to is essentially what lives within that dotted uh, blue circle, or more particularly the floating, the three icons of the LNG carriers and the FSRU. And I'm really going to touch upon the points that Phil discussed in general uh, that have operational aspects and draw distinctions between the onshore and the offshore terminals. And the first point, of course, to pick up on is uh, where Phil discussed the, the issue of potential off-spec cargoes and the way in which that can be mitigated or at least managed. And of course, in most sale and purchase agreements, one will expect there to be some sort of reasonable endeavor that one will, as a terminal, try and address or as a buyer of the terminal, try and address an off-spec cargo. Now, with an onshore terminal, as Phil suggested, that if you've got the luxury of um, additional tanks, then, of course, there's always a way of basically commingling your way out of an off-spec issue. Uh, and that may be whether it's too rich or too lean. If we're talking about the, the FSRU, then save for where you're getting a small scale delivery, as Phil indicated, in most cases, the, the cargo lot that's being delivered will be similar, in fact, in many cases larger than the capacity of the FSRU. So that essentially rules out that means of mitigating. Now, Phil also mentioned that at least where we're talking about where the specification is too lean, that you can blend your way. And of course, there's a distinction between co-mingling and blending. And with blending, what we mean would be to introduce a slug of LPG or at least some other heavier alkane mix to try and raise the calorific intensity of the, the cargo back into specification. And of course, onshore, if you have the availability and the ability to blend, well, that's wonderful. But on an FSRU, that just isn't going to happen, or even FSU. And the reason for that is, is that the, it creates a risk of rollover, which without going into essentially means you can have a rapid release of the boil off. And that's difficult for the, 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 the FSIU or FSU to manage. And it's not permitted contraction. It's not that it's a regulatory issue. It's that the guidance um, that is generally followed by all of these floating installations is from SIGTO. And contractually, we'll find either in the charter, the operating lease, or indeed in the sale and purchase agreements that the parties will 
perform to international standards, and that will include a definition that has SIGTOs, regulations, guidance, but not regulations, sorry, publications and guidance in it. So essentially that means we're not going to have the option to blend our way out either if the off-spec is too lean. If it's too rich, then we've got the other issue, which is again, we can't commingle our way out of it. Onshore, you'd normally have a solution called Wobbo correction, whereby you can inject nitrogen into the send out to correct, that is to lower the calorific intensity of the gas. But in most cases with FSRU, that equipment would not be provided. I have to say in most cases, because there's so many distinctions. And of course, the very first slide we had was a lovely picture of ELT Toscana, which is a thumping great Wobbe correction plant on board, because it was always anticipated that there might be that need. She was designed with third party access as mine. She was designed with the need perhaps to store and that specification might change on board. But again, that's the exception, just as the small scale might be the exception to the commingling. For the most part, we just do not have that luxury where we're dealing with a floating terminal. And of course, these issues become more acute when one's talking about third party access, because one has to resolve the issue between the, the, the parties. Um, now, moving on to another point that Phil touched on about this, the similarity uh, between the cargo capacity of the FSRU and the delivering cargo lot. Actually, in many cases, as I say, if you're talking about the early FSRU, and by that I mean anything pre about 2006, then they had less than 140,000, 145,000 at best cubic capacity on board. Whereas we look at the workhorses of the spot market now, they're the 150,000 cubic diesel electric era, which is sort of 2006, 2016, or the more modern vessels that are available because they're expected to be built perhaps in the short and midterm market, which are way up at the 170, just shy of 180,000 mark. And of course, even if we look at the FSU solutions, the natural selection might be to look at an X project LNG carrier because it's steam powered, it's regas, uh, sorry, it's, it's uh, boil off rate is too high, it's too inefficient in terms of fuel consumption. It makes a lovely donor for an FSU, but again, it's a much smaller capacity. So not only do we have that issue in terms of the, the, the mismatch, but it pushes us even further to the commercial bazaar to run the inventory of the FSRU as low as possible before our scheduled delivery. And of course, that's an issue one doesn't have onshore, and it exposes the risk if there is a delay in that delivery. And with an FSRU terminal by its very nature, then it tends to be used as a fast start, or it may be used where perhaps there's less infrastructure, such as breakwater to protect them, or it may be used such as Toscana or the Bangladeshi terminals in open water situations where they will be periodically exposed to weather conditions that will not allow cargo transfer, especially the side to side cargo transfer operations, all of which, of course, pose a, at least a risk that you'll have delays in delivery windows. And if you've got rundown inventory, that may mean that the operator will need to cease send out, uh, if only to protect the minimum uh, heel on board to try and keep the cargo tanks cold, because otherwise if the tanks get warm, we have the added problem that we now need to cool down with the next delivery before we can do bulk cargo transfers, which of course just increases the period of the um, the, the transfer and therefore the potential to merge. We also end up with the potential that we may have to switch the FSIU onto fuel oil because we run out of, of boil off. Now, single user, of course, it's quite easy to allocate where that risk might lie, but with multi-user that becomes more complicated, hence the need, as Phil said, for these operating codes. Because at least when we're talking about off-spec, it's easy causatively to say, well, that was that one user that created this problem. If you're talking about something which is effectively, if you're like a peril of the sea, it's nature. Um, how does that risk lie? Is that a risk that is allocated between all, essentially? Um, and uh, of course, when I mentioned the fleet that was mostly going to be delivering all of those vessels, essentially, post 2006 onwards, the, um, would have been built with the membrane containment systems. And so in those open water um, FSRU locations, then they have the added issue that they, they must not put to sea, if you like, pull out of the transfer while the liquid levels are within the, the sloshing limits. And put very simply, this is usually that between 10% of the height in the tank and 70% of the height in the tank, the ship shouldn't set to sea 
while the, the liquid is at level. So you need more time within that weather window to allow uh, time to bring the vessel into seaworthy state, all of which, of course, makes the delivery schedule more sensitive or potentially more sensitive with an FSRU. Now, lastly, just to the, I have the time and also give Daisy a hook, um, one of the things that Phil mentioned was, of course, the need to treat the, the cargo on board uh, in the inventory system with the FSRU. And of course, that may mean, uh, depending on the local law considerations as well, that in fact the operator becomes the title holder to the cargo when it's on board and holds it to the strict account essentially in trust for the users. Uh, and that opens up potential differences in terms of exposures to insolvencies. And the very fact that you're using an FSIU means that in some jurisdictions, probably most actually, it will still be considered a ship. The LNG on board may still be considered as a cargo or indeed fuel for the FSIU which opens up the potential of other liabilities in the, an admiralty basis, which is again, just another part to feature into a risk matrix, which hopefully is a nice lead in for Daisy, who's now going to talk about that in the context of financing. Daisy, may I hand over to you, please? Uh, thank you, Marcus. So I think if we move on to the next slide, please, Heike. I'm going to talk um, given the time quite briefly, from the perspective of financing the power plant, uh, sourcing gas using one of these structures. As Phil mentioned from the start, in the context of onshore terminals in markets where the pipeline system is well established and probably unbundled, the third party access is the norm and in power projects using LNG supplied through those pipelines or, or through those onshore terminals, the risk profile is pretty well understood. Um, the challenge is when you move to developing markets where the pipeline system is new and to some extent untested, the risk that parties using it, whether inputting or withdrawing, overuse, that they might overuse or under, underuse, leading to imbalance, is increased. If we then put that in the context of an FSRU, where for the most part, as Marcus mentioned, the margin for error is significantly reduced and the scope to rebalance or fix spec issues is negligible, we can see lenders to the power plant will be anxious to fully understand the impact of the risks to the project company from the actions of third party users. Marcus also mentioned the, uh, the issues around multi-use and who owns the gas, the trust issues and, and insolvency issues, and all of that comes into the structure and the, the lenders to the power plant at the end of the process are going to be looking to try and push those risks away from the project company. Of course, as we discussed in episode three, one of the risks a sole user power plant will face with an FSOU is the liability that it incurs for failure to take gas due to, for example, they're having an outage and that risk as we mentioned then, could be to some extent mitigated by there being one or two other users supplied by the FSRU. But in a way, that's just the other side of the same card. In the next few slides, I'm going to look at a high level of the contractual structures that could be deployed to move third party access risks away from the power project SPV. This first slide that we've got here shows the physical journey of the gas from the LNG carrier through the FSRU and the pipeline to the end users. Moving to the next slide, this is one who those of you who attended previous webinars will have seen before or a variation on it. The risks that lenders look to assess in bankability analysis don't change particularly in terms of their, their sort of category of risk just because of third party access structure, but some of them become more probable in their impact if they, if they occur because their impact is more significant. This is particularly the case for scheduling and non-performance as Phil and Marcus have discussed. As Phil mentioned, where third party access in, is in reality a second or perhaps a third user taking gas from a system that's been established by another power plant, it seems realistic that the three may be able to coordinate with each other. Lenders may take comfort if there's shared equity between the FSRU and at least one of the users, presumably the first one. But where the pipeline system is not in shared equity with any of the users, and it's perhaps a more open access, then as Phil noted, since the, pi the pipeline operator is not in much of a position to absorb liability for getting it wrong. A different approach is going to be required. If we move on to the next slide, if the host government is the offtaker from the power plant, then what I've put across the bottom of this slide is a, a blue line for an energy conversion agreement. And that may be a good way to manage the risk away from the power project SPV as the offtaker is then responsible for procuring LNG shipments and will have the interface itself with the, with the FSRU and the pipeline system around uh, ensuring that shipments can be delivered, looking at who's liable if, they, if, if something goes wrong with, as, as Marcus said, if, if there's not enough space to offload a shipment um, and, and aligning it to its own demands. 
That does rely, of course, on a creditworthy host government offtaker. It could apply using a, it could work with a private offtaker, but in the markets where I think we've been discussing an FSRU structure is likely to be deployed, the offtaker is less likely, that, that sort of offtaker is less likely to be present. In either case, lenders need to be comfortable that the project company is protected by the power purchaser from a debt service and OPEX perspective in the event that gas supply is interrupted because of issues with other users. A variation on this uh, would be for the power purchase, for the power, uh, sorry, the power generating SPV to essentially toll the LNG through the FSRU itself and so function as the gas purchaser, the LNG purchaser, and sell under a separate offtake agreement. In that situation, it will bear the risk of scheduling problems or more of the risk, and it will need to try to ensure pass through of remedies and liabilities for not taking gas because of non performance by the offtaker and vice versa. And we'll need to be need to ensure that those are managed through the contractual chain, as, as we've discussed in previous sessions. And the lenders will be particularly focused on what protection the power project SPV has if the gas supply is interrupted because of issues in the third party access arrangements that are beyond its control. And that's, that does put it in a slightly different position to under an energy conversion agreement. On the next slide, we can see the situation where you've got a gas toller essentially a gas aggregator, which Marcus and, um, and Phil have also mentioned, the slightly different diagrams. Not necessarily a host government purchaser, but quite likely, buying LNG, tolling it through the FSRU to sell onto the power plant and to other users. And this starts to look much more like a typical gas-fired power project with a normal gas supply agreement under which the gas supply is responsible for delivering on-spec gas in accordance with the operating schedule of the power plant. And so that puts the burden onto the gas, the, the aggregator, to, to deal with issues in the pipeline, issues with spec, issues with, with delivery. But again, you've got issues around the creditworthiness of that gas supplier to keep you whole against the other end of the contractual chain, um, where, where of course you've got the offtaker demanding, demanding supply. So my final slide is one which again, you'll be familiar with from previous webinars if you've attended them. I've adapted it slightly to reflect the additional mitigants that might be deployed where there are third party users in the system. It largely reflects what we've discussed over the previous slides, so it's more of an aid memoir really. So I wasn't planning to revisit the detail again. So that's a fairly whistle stop tour, but I think it's it's been well discussed what the issues are. Um, the equity and the debt uh, would be would be very much aligned on, on allocating risks to those best, best position to bear them. Um, and I think we can move now on to the Q&A. Heike, over to you. Thank you for switching on your, your cameras. Um, so we have a few questions, which is great. And uh, I'm in the uh, unique position to dish them out, which is even better. Um, so the first one we have is on carbon capture and offsets. Uh, now, looking like they will become a mainstream component of the LNG value chain and whether any of us uh, is involved in that, uh, and if so, how. So obviously uh, one thing is uh, uh, carbon capture and storage in order to reduce uh, the carbon footprint of the uh, LNG um, value chain. Um, and, uh, and the other one is obviously uh, the, the carbon trading, uh, both presumably go hand in hand. Um, I can talk a little bit about this, but uh, I want to hear Phil's uh, uh, thoughts first of all, and then I can supplement perhaps. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly won't uh, talk about uh, uh, what's your Farley Williams response to that, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> I think it, it's, um, I mean, it's a good question. I think it's a much wider question at the moment that, that actually um, I haven't seen many good answers for. I mean, my perception would be that, that at the moment, anyone looking to do um, uh, new projects uh, up and down the LNG value chain is not only going to have to think in terms of making that uh, from a commercial perspective as, as strong as possible in order to, to, to raise the lending, but, but actually I think they're gonna to have to come up with a fairly comprehensive uh, story as to how they are mitigating any potential uh, carbon impact. Um, and, and I think if they don't have that together, it, it seems to me that, that um, you know, uh, prospective lenders are, 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 are going to be um, uh, reluctant to, to take it too, too seriously, because I think everyone is under pressure now in terms of 
uh, further investments in anything that looks like hydrocarbons. Unfortunately, gas and LNG has been caught up with that discussion now. Um, so I think there's a, a, a much broader point about the extent to which uh, investors will still continue to be uh, um, uh, uh, investing in these sort of projects going forward. Um, but I think as, as a minimum, uh, developers will need to put together, together the story, which hopefully will um, and probably will include uh, specific mitigants that will deal with uh, either direct uh, or indirect offsets of the uh, carbon impact of, of that um, of that particular project. I think it's a, I think it's inevitable, and I think the days when um, it was really a, a focus just around commercial and financial in, uh, uh, aspects of a project uh, are, are are now over, and there needs to be a much wider uh, package brought to potential lenders and investors. Uh, in order for um, these projects now to to reach FID. Sure. So just to add, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Watson Valley and Williams, we have, and, and this is uh, you know pretty much in what uh, what Phil has just said. Uh, particularly if you are doing carbon trading, you know if the or when the price of carbon uh, increases, then obviously the uh, uh, the value chain, uh, every part of the value chain will be required to reduce uh, the emissions in order to keep the costs for the carbons down. Um, you know, just another point. And we have seen that obviously with the Qataris uh, now introducing CCUS uh, into their North Field East. And, um, and, and so I think I agree, you know, definitely this is the way forward. And the way we have been starting to work on this is uh, in carbon neutral um, LNG cargoes uh, being uh, traded along, uh, well, the emissions being basically carbon uh, uh, offsets being traded along with the LNG cargo. So this is something we have seen more and more, and we are involved in that. Uh, we have not worked on a project so far where CCSU uh, is, CCUS, sorry, is part of the overall chain, but I think that it's very early days anyway. So hopefully we get a chance uh, to, to follow one of our clients on that. Next question, probably I'd say for um, for Marcus, and I'm sort of conscious we are at 10 o'clock now. An example picture of multi-user delivery to an FSRU was shown, assuming three other users taking turns. Uh, if a vessel runs late, how do you manage? Do they pay demorage uh, on all or some following of vessels? And uh, what if the vessel sails away? Uh, in a failure to take scenario. Do, do you want to take that on, Marcus? Yeah, I, well, I, I suppose actually, as, as Phil mentioned, actually the scheduling is such that normally you've got quite a significant gap in between different calls. And so unlike uh, a shore-based terminal, particularly an export terminal, uh, you're unlikely, I would suggest, to have that level of knock-on, except in extreme examples, in which case you probably diverted the cargoes anyway. Uh, I think also typically in terms of liquidating damages and managing risk, you'd normally rule it out at the, the first vessel impact. I mean, that's normally in trading contracts anyway. And of course, you may even liquidate what those damages might be. So with, I would suggest that in most cases, you're not going to see that risk. And if you did, you would mitigate it in the contract, to take away the extremity of that mm -hmm. risk. Because um, you're right, there must be extreme examples where the terminal is actually put out of action, et cetera. And there may be all sorts of complexities but for the most part, no, I, I don't think so. You would limit it to the next vessel. <laughs> okay. And the next question is, uh, does the multi-user access to FSIU drive liability regimes more towards knock to knock, sorry, knock for knock, uh, or a more bespoke and specific uh, allocation of liability? Well, I must say, I have not seen knock for knock uh, in um, uh, FSIUs or, or in these kind of projects. Uh, not to say that uh, you know, somebody is not uh, thinking about that, but it's more when you have uh, different uh, contractors on one uh, facility, I guess, uh, that, that you need these kind of uh, uh, liability regimes. I mean, it's the physical nature of them being around and injuring each other with their equipment or whatever, which is obviously not the case. This is more a contractual uh, share of the... Um, 
uh, of the facilities and therefore uh, a specific allocation of liability to me, uh, certainly what I've seen is uh, uh, what I think uh, it will mean. But Phil, do you have a thought on that just briefly? We are out of time. <laughs> I think Marcus has more of a thought than me, so let me... Okay, Marcus. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I thought anything to do with marine liability, I, I'd take the heat, as it were. Um, <laughs> look, I, I remember one of the early FSRU projects, we had a lot of discussion about this, and there's a lot of sense in not for not these situations, particularly where you're talking about effectively an STS operation, uh, particularly in those offshore locations. Um, and of course, it does take away the spectre of having to have a claim against one of your users if you assume that the user is actually using its own vessels, which of course is, I suspect, the rarity. So in most cases, what's happening is your user is chartering in a vessel. That vessel has insurance for this sort of issue that we're thinking about, the sort of physical consequences of the STS going wrong. And for that reason, it's very unlikely that you would go down the knock-for-knock -knock route. In fact, I can only think of one knock-for-knock -knock terminal, and that's Panagaglia. That was completely different. Onshore terminal, very small vessels. It didn't fit with the logic of the, um, the, the standard regime, the 150 cap. And for most FSIUs, I suspect it just makes more sense. Take advantage of the insurances that you have available. Make the calling vessel liable up to 150 million as long as it's not entirely strict liability, i.e. you do allow for the sole liability or causation of the terminal, everybody's happy. Just don't mess with the poolable aspect of the insurance. And that's something, a lesson that seems to be forgotten recently. But otherwise, um, no, I, I don't see why the multi-user aspect should push you towards knock for knock, much as I think it's a very respectable regime. Thank you. And we just have a new one. Uh, with regards to balancing rules in emerging markets, what are your thoughts about who owns the line pack, and I would like to say the heel, uh, in the FSRU, so the system operator or the shipper? I think that's when for Phil. I thought you might say that. Um, <laughs> let, let, me, um, let, let me address that in, in terms of the, the onshore system, I think, which it, it, it reads as though uh, when you're talking about line pack, that's, that's, that's what it's aimed at. Um, Look, I, I mean, the, the, the answer is it's, it's not to do with my thoughts. I mean, th this is something that's um, pretty specific, I think, within uh, pipeline systems. And it's, it's, not, uh, it's not always the same. Um, uh, and uh, I have seen slightly different ways of dealing with it. But I mean, from a practical and operational point of view, then the party that actually needs access to line pack, because line pack is something that is available, uh, as I say, mainly for a few hours, it's the operator that needs access to that and will use the line pack in order to uh, balance everyone's needs on behalf of everyone. Um, so the complexity of uh, that being any other way, uh, to my mind, is as soon as you've got a number of users, um, any, any potential sort of benefits of, of, um, uh, of that being available, if you like, for use by shippers rather than the uh, the operator um, soon soon falls away. So, um, yeah, I think with one or two users, you can have a different system. As soon as it starts to become multi-user, then uh, line pack really needs to be uh, the responsibility of the operator. Of course, the second um, factor, and I think which is this is where the question is probably coming from, is yeah, but what what happens um, if there's a leakage and you know there's a number, there's there's a, a leakage of gas and gas has been lost from that system. And is the system operator, going back to my previous comment, in a position to actually accept the full liability for that? And so there's, there's ways of dealing with that. But the, the, the answer, I think, essentially is, you know, once it enters the system, um, the operator is, is the party that needs to be dealing with the uh, line pack rather than the shippers. Okay. And I just have a last question for Daisy, uh, if you thought you escaped here. Um, we have seen changes in banks' attitudes uh, towards financing hydrocarbon projects in recent years, which was perhaps amplified uh, by, by COVID. Do banks still lend on LNG and gas projects? And assuming they do, which I think they do, uh, with uh, transition looming, how may the resulting uncertainty affect the tenor and perhaps other terms of financing? That's quite an interesting question. I think, as um, as, as Phil said earlier, the the ESG credentials of, of a project are are going to take ever higher priority. It's not just going to be about the the money and the feasibility. 
Um, I think what we what we can see in the market is plenty of gas fired power is is still being financed, is being refinanced, refinanced. I think that it it will be probably an increasingly small, increasingly small contradiction, but an ever smaller in group of lenders who do it. Um, but they will do it as part of a transition program. So it'll need it'll be up to the project to demonstrate that this is the way to start a country's transition from coal, from coal, from heavy fuel oil, whatever it is. And, and of course, that the alternative to not doing it is that they, they stick with coal and then there's an unpleasant gap when coal is no longer feasible at all, but they don't yet have the, the systems and the regimes to, to put in place energy. And that's, that, that is something I think the, the, the market generally can't be responsible for a, a power gap like that. So I think the transition argument is the argument that will be made. The impact on tenors, I think, will will vary. You know that that they probably will get shorter over time. And and again, FSRUs are perhaps a, a good way to to approach it because they're reasonably temporary installation for the power rather than the capex of a massive regas facility onshore that that then does only have a shorter lifespan whilst they transition to an even greener version um, at, at a later point. I, I don't know whether anybody else on the panel, Phil, perhaps you've got an observation on that. Uh, I agree. <laughs> That's great. And actually, guys, we are out of time. Thank you so much uh, for, for, you know, to our speakers for being here this morning with us and to all of our audience um, to, you know, sharing their time this morning with us. And I hope uh, you found this useful. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.